What's up, Internet? It's your soul, and I really am happy to announce that I've finally found a human being that I agree with 100%, as far as I can tell anyway from this nearly two hour long video from Daniel Schmachtenberger. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Never heard of him before. He appears to be a philosopher and kind of systems analyst type, a uh, big picture thinking person, and very similar to me in a lot of ways in the way that I think and approach the world. And the great thing about him is that he thinks very clearly, he's very concise, doesn't fluff his language, and has clearly spent a lot of time, let's say, or put a lot of focus into refining his language and communicating his ideas in a very neat and tidy way. So something that I aim to do but I'm not as effective as him definitely I would say and he manages to talk here for nearly two hours taking us on a journey on what he calls sense making and the war on sense making and the short version of that is he's explaining in a very precise way the problems we have when we think the common pitfalls in thinking the errors we tend to make the biases and the structural problems in society that cause us to manipulate information, lie, receive false information, and just the huge amount of distortion that there is in all of the information that we get, and you know basically where it comes from and what we can do about it. And this is obviously an issue that anybody who uses the internet to research and to learn about the world faces, or even away from the internet, something you face when you're at school even, or reading textbooks and so on. Ultimately, all information we receive from anywhere has the potential to be incorrect, even unintentionally incorrect, and there's a long list of ways that it could be intentionally incorrect. So he discusses numerous different aspects of this, and really, I would say that anybody can benefit from listening to him, even people who really think that they have cleared up most of their stinking thinking and their false beliefs and so on. I think he's probably going to say at least a few things in here that you haven't thought of before. Um, I, because I've put so much focus into this subject, I have already thought of most of what he's saying, but there was a few points in there that I hadn't, hadn't thought of and not in the way that he put it across. So I'm just going to play you a few scenes from this. I definitely recommend going and checking out the whole video. This is just going to be really a short review, but, um, yeah, very impressed. I think it's clear to probably most of your listeners that the things called news are mostly propaganda, uh, narrative warfare for some agency, and that they aren't good sources of sense-making. We would hope, though, that there are some sources of high-signal, low-noise, true information, like maybe scientific journals, like academia, science itself. I hoped this a long time ago. <laughs> I had the continuous kind of disappointment. You know, I started being like, okay, I can't, I can't trust news to be true because news is narrative warfare. I can't trust science without actually really looking at what was the methodology employed? How was it funded? What were the axioms that the team was using? What were the logical transforms? Am I seeing all of their data or the cherry pick data? And as, we, as I started to kind of unfold to say, where are the high signal, low noise sources that I can offload some of the cognitive complexity of making sense of the world to? The answer is really sad, right? I don't know any sources that are very high signal and low noise ac across lots of areas. So then we start being like, well, why is that? And what would it take to fix that? What would it take to make a world that had an intact information ecology? Well, that requires understanding why the current information ecology is as broken as it is. And we're starting to touch on a couple things here, but this goes deep. And how do we make good choices if we don't have good sense making? Well, obviously we can't. But due to increasing technological capacity, right? Increasing population multiplied by increasing impact per person. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind, right? And so I think many of the people that you've had on Rebel Wisdom have been in a deep inquiry around 
how do we actually fix our own sense making? And it's some of what has brought us to have conversations with each other, because a part of how we work with our own sense making is we recognize the cognitive complexity of issues that the world faces is more than a single person can process. So that's, as you can see, he's very uh, effective in his communication and very clear. And really what he's talking about is a big part of the motivation behind my creating Eureka.org, social network that I run that integrates the Steam blockchain. The idea, although it's not being marketed uh, and developed fully, is ultimately to support more or less what he's saying here, which is to help us to help ourselves to filter out the noise from the news or um, another way of putting it is uh, that someone I know likes to use is finding the smarties in the bullshit because there's so much false and wrong information in the world that finding the truly useful pieces of information can be a major challenge and sometimes that information comes from inside of us the really helpful information and sometimes it comes from analyzing information that's outside of us through the inside of us and it's important, I would say, for us to have a way to share when we're doing that. And obviously the internet's very good for doing that, but the social media platforms that we encounter today, such as Google, Facebook, Twitter, and so on, uh, basically are set up to limit and hamper us in our ability to do that. And he does go into quite a lot of detail, although not specifically talking about social network censorship, but goes into a lot of detail about some of the reasons why that happens. Uh, but, ranging from deliberate corporate censorship in order to increase personal power of those people doing the censorship uh, through to basically just different beliefs people have that lead them to conclude that certain information shouldn't be shared. Uh, you know, all these different reasons which probably most of us are familiar with via the internet. So, yeah, very happy to, to hear him going full steam ahead in explaining sense-making, which is a great phrase, and, you know, everyone wants to make sense, I think, ultimately. And yet it's amazing in a way, or quite telling, that this concept of sense making is a new phrase for many of us. Although we, we think about making sense, we don't necessarily think of it in the terms of his presentation here, where he's actually explaining the mechanics of how do you make sense. Brain that can't actually hold that cognitive complexity. So it requires collective intelligence and collective sense making. But I can't just offload the cognitive complexity to some authority because I can't trust that they're actually doing good sense making. Maybe they're doing good sense making within a very limited context, but then the application of that outside of the context is different. And maybe there's even distortions within their context. So I have to try and find other people that are also really endeavoring to sense make well, which means they have to understand what causes failures in sense making. And then we have to see, can we create relationships with each other that remove the distortion basis? that is normally there. So um, yeah, I think, I think what I, from what I have seen of Rebel Wisdom, this is probably the strange attractor of what is bringing everybody to watch it, is people who are trying to make sense of the world better themselves and are trying to find sources of content of other, of other people that have been trying to make sense of it well. So Rebel Wisdom, first time I've heard of them, they appear to be a group uh, running a channel online and organizing events, as he says, basically doing the good work of bringing people together to uh, pool resources and generate clear signal and clear understanding of what's happening on Earth. And again, it's very similar to what I'm intending to use social media for in general. So I'll definitely be checking them out more. <clears throat> Which is what I'm excited about. And so those are just some opening thoughts. And yeah, I look forward to getting into why we have as broken an information ecology as we have and what it would take to correct that at, a, at scale and how we can make sense of the world even in the broken information ecology now in terms of practical processes. I've never actually shared publicly these types of frameworks before, so this feels fun and exciting. And uh, I, I hope that it's useful as I've been trying to uh, make sense of the world, making sense of why sense-making is so hard is pretty central. There's a famous quote, I think attributed to Einstein, make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. 
as simple as possible, really the goal is, is as clear as possible, right? But simpler would mean it's wrong, like it's not accurate anymore. If I'm, you know, you're going to have to face this doing media work, there will be pressures on you to say, hey, people can't pay attention more than sound bites. You got to make it five minute chunks. The, the word size is too big. Make it for an eighth grade level, right? Which is saying people are dumb. So spoon feed them stuff that dumb people can handle, which to the degree you do that and it's successful will keep people dumb. But that's what, that's what like those are the pressures in, in anyone doing broadcast, even for a hopefully good intention, right? And if we want people to actually be able to make sense of the world well, you can't do it in very short periods of time with lots of distraction and oversimplified. Like if you, if you look at anyone who actually increased the sense-making capacity of the world, you look at any scientist or philosopher, they didn't do it in tweets and they didn't do it radically distracted and they didn't do it in a dumbed down process, right? Like I have, I have so many people who have written to me saying like, we want to create a new kind of education, young people, we want to create a new kind of education that uh, makes everybody like Bucky Fuller's or Leonardo's that conditions um, polymaths. And they say this because I've written some stuff on that topic. And that they have some sense that they could lead that. And I'm like, have you read Bucky's books? Like, well, no, we mostly don't read books. Um, and have you read the references in Bucky's books to just see the amount of shit that he read and referenced to make sense of things well? And so there's a, there, there's a decoupling of the sense of the agency possible with what it takes to do it. It's, you know, like, there's a saying everywhere in almost all domains uh, to this effect of like everybody wants to be buff but nobody wants to lift heavy ass weights or everybody wants to win but nobody wants to work hard or there's something like that that happens here is if I want to be able to make sense of the world well I have to work at that and if I want to be able to make sense of the world better the world better than I currently do like attention requires being trained, just like muscles require being trained. Thinking clearly requires being trained. And anytime I'm, there's a hormetic process, you know, hormesis is the principle by which you stress an adaptive system to increase its adaptive capacity. So I have to stress a muscle to get the muscle to grow. If I'm lifting an amount of weight that's super easy, the muscle, there's no input that says the muscle needs to be bigger. And there's a cost to getting bigger, right? So it's only gonna go through that cost if it's being stressed. And the same is true, like, if I expose myself to more heat and more cold than is comfortable, I actually gain greater metabolic flexibility to deal with heat and cold, which means that if I stay in an environment where I always have heating and air conditioning, I'll actually lose metabolic flexibility. You have to stress the system to be able to grow the system in, in a particular kind of way. Right, so there's lots of these covered there already. Uh, Buckminster Fuller was a, I suppose you could say, genius. Um, inventor, thinker. Uh, he's famous for having come up with a new sacred geometrical form and form of carbon, as I recall, uh, the fullerene. I'm I'm not an expert in Buck, Buckminster Fuller's work at all, but I know enough about him to know those things. Um, and obviously Leonardo uh, da Vinci, not DiCaprio. <laughs> um, basically inventors and wanting, and he's he's discussing there the idea that human potential allows us to be all oh, ultimately potentially become that version of ourselves that that leads new avenues of creativity in human life and highlighting that to do that is not an easy thing to do and you need to work hard and focus on it so again that's something that i find quite frustrating with conversations on the internet being as the internet is ultimately this hugely powerful resource for information albeit one that's being quite limited and controlled at the moment for the moment, we still have access to a lot of information and many, many people, uh, although thankfully not so many in the particular groups that I participate in, uh, don't seem to have any problems with 
talking all day long about subjects that they haven't even done the most basic research into, as if they know everything. And it's really a staggering phenomena in a lot of ways. And I'm not claiming to be the world's expert in everything by any means, but I am quite happy to sit and study and read for hours and hours and hours uh, on certain subjects because I want to understand them. And it's not about winning, it's about simply knowing the truth so that I can make good decisions. And that's a principle which um, Daniel brings up many times in this talk, the idea that competition itself actually is a barrier to the truth and to human development in, a, in many ways. Although competition can result in creativity as people seek to use that competition to acquire more resources and wealth and so on, ultimately competition also introduces many problems such as deceptive behaviours, lying, let's say corporate, he brings up the example of corporations who release false information to put their competitors off. So, um, I mean, although I was aware of that, he, he brings up an idea that I hadn't even thought of before, which is uh, we know that scientific studies tend to be proven to be false, the majority of them after not very long. And I'm certainly aware that a great deal of science is deliberately misleading in order to have the world think that certain ideas are true to then further the economic success of a company, maybe selling a product or something like that. What I hadn't thought of was that these companies are actually releasing false information in order to put off their competitors. So they release a study that says X, Y, Z, the competitors go off and think, oh, we need to look into that, or you know, they divert some of their resources into that. And you know, it might take them a year or two to realise that actually that wasn't even true information, they just made it up. Uh, you know, and meanwhile, that first company that's commissioned that report has gone off doing the real work behind the scenes, and now they've gained a competitive advantage. The victims of that obviously being everyone who read the study and thought that it was real and changed their worldview as a result. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, that literally, I just never thought of that before. I just, it would never have occurred to me that, that that's, that these people would be that deceptive. But, you know, I should have known better because I've seen these people, <laughs> seen many corporations and groups lie in even worse ways before. But there's lots of examples like that that he brings up, which I definitely recommend watching the whole interview here for, because it's really quite mind expanding, even for the most cynical and <laughs> um, open minded thinker, let's say. I guarantee there'll be one or two things in here and thought of at least. Another great part in this is where he talks about memes and, you know, from those who haven't really studied the idea of memes so much, memes essentially, as I understand them, are uh these kind of thought equivalent of genes so in the same way that information can be passed on from human to human through genetics memes can be passed on from human to human through thoughts and thinking and communication so he talks here about how for example religions are built on memes and in other words ideas and he talks about how religions have essentially to some extent, evolved through a process of going from being quite abstract and open, where, for example, you'd have a spirit of the land, a spirit of the trees, a spirit that's everywhere, which I understand to be true, personally, and then it went through a process of uh, you know, having many gods, and then ultimately to one god, and he's just highlighting how the memes that surround that reflect that transformation in a way that you can see how effectively the religious viewpoints of humanity have in many cases been weaponized so that you've gone from a quite open situation where well every, everything's spirit and therefore i don't really need any sort of middleman or interpreter for me to be aware of my own source and nature as a spirit through to a situation where you've got these many gods that all have to be sort of bowed down to and understood individually in order for you to have power uh, and then onto this one god where some religious groups have claimed that for example, you know, you must conform to X, Y, Z, other memes and ideas, or you're going to hell forever. And, you know, and people, he highlights that people in some communities, for example, then obviously feel threatened by that. And obviously also then are having to deal with the other idea that says that if they don't go along with these ideas, then the community isn't going to support them and protect them if they're under threat. So there's a very powerful influence there for people to conform to ideas which ultimately from these religions may not even be in their best interest and often aren't so it's this long deep journey and winding process of unwinding the knots and kinks in our own thought process so that we can actually see clearly and understand reality for what it is rather than what people would have us believe it is 
and often they've done that deliberately misleading us for their own benefit. And this is absolutely part of the journey to enlightenment of ourself. And enlightenment isn't this mystical process of or or pinnacle experience of suddenly meeting Buddha or something like that. Enlightenment is simply the process of understanding correctly. That's it. And yeah, sure, you can understand the nature of reality completely and very deeply in a very powerful way that can lead to spiritual type experiences. And I recommend you do that. But at the same time, it doesn't have to be this mystical process. It can actually be elements of it certainly involve what we might call mundane thought processes simply being clarified and cleaned up so that they're accurate and efficient and not leading us down false avenues. And I really like his approach here. It's really it's really on the target for what I understand to be needed and it's the same process that's worked for me. And I'm just really glad to have to have had the experience of hearing him and I hope to hear more in the future. In fact I actually think that of the countless days and hours I've spent talking to people online and attempting to dis- disseminate certain fragments of what he's explaining here to them in short periods and writing longer parts of this into essay form and some longer videos i think i can probably save five seven ten years of my life now just by showing people this video because it's actually such an excellent way of explaining this information it also gives me someone to reference when people sometimes claim that i'm big-headed or arrogant or i look down on everyone and i don't really respect anyone's ideas and i think everyone's an idiot and that kind of thing that's none of that's true really uh it's just that i happen to have done the kind of work that he's talking about which actually clarifies to me a great deal that people just don't even think about a lot of the time. And so for me to be able to to even explain my thought processes to most people takes a long time because you have to fill in many gaps and many questions and answers that just aren't in the common mind. So sometimes people take that position that I put across and the frustration sometimes I have with that as meaning that I'm arrogant and don't care for people and put people down and stuff. It's just not how I am. It's just, you know, you need to understand that you put this much time and focus into drawing clarity into your mental process in a world where people just don't do that. It's very frustrating. And, you know, it's kudos to him for having put even more focus than I have into how to communicate this excellently to people so that we can expand collectively in a way that means that those who have put that much energy and focus into sense making, as he calls it, feel less depressed and <laughs> intimidated perhaps and frustrated when talking to you know people who might be dogmatic in their position that might even be a dangerous position uh, who won't listen to them and even ridicule them and call them retards and that kind of thing in the last few days i've had two nazis two neo-nazis i would say quite openly neo-nazis on on a certain social network call me a retard uh basically when i was sharing information which is i would say very high signal to noise ratio very high signal and clearly explained and yet basically i would say they felt threatened by it they're not used to hearing things put across in such a difficult to argue with way and they go into their defense mechanism mode they feel fear and then their anger triggers and boom there you go you know they're going to attack you and that's really my my focus for the future is taking the wisdom he's explaining here and applying it into healing processes and devising systems that actually help us create peace. And at the end of this video, he actually says, well, we don't have, no one's ever put forward any solutions to these problems that work. None of the political systems we have work. They're all based in conflict and error. And I completely agree with that. Um, I have actually personally put in a huge amount of time into answering this challenge. And that is a part of what I'm going to be putting across in the rest of my life, basically, is how do we live together? In short, in ways which are non-violent and completely successful and optimal and peaceful and enjoyable for everyone. And that part that I described where people become intimidated or afraid of certain awareness or logic or realisation, perhaps realising that they've, they're have they holding false beliefs and that they've acted throughout their life on these beliefs in ways that have caused harm to people and suddenly they're faced with the reality that they were mistaken. The chances are their their mindset is not going to be open enough for them to just say, "Oh, wow, sorry, yeah, you're right. Thanks for telling me." You know, often they just go into violent aggression again. So we need ways to broach that with people to help them defuse their own 
cognitive bias, let's say, and their own intent to do harm ultimately and deny reality. And that's definitely something that I've that I've focused heavily into. And it reminded me of a cat that I once lived with <laughs> as a pet when I was younger, and we took it in as a stray cat. Parents did, and it had been hit by a car, and they actually took it to a vet, and it had surgery on its jaw, and uh, actually had some metal put in there to rebuild its jaw. It was quite a significant injury. And I'd never met the cat before we took it in, and and you know I like cats a lot. I spent a lot of time with them. And I found I was quite young. I think maybe I was eight or ten, that kind of age. I found that I could stroke it, but after not very long, it would freak out and just attack me, basically. And you know I can understand to some extent why it was doing that. It felt threatened, and it had gone through some tough times. It was a he actually. Um, and. But at the same time, I didn't have a deep enough understanding to make sense of why this was happening exactly. If I'd spent, I, you know, in my mind, if I'd spent a year with this cat making friends with it and treating it really well, I felt like if it was attacking me, I felt like it was just wrong. Why would you do that? Why would you basically harm someone who's being so nice to you? And it's only through extensive learning of the emotional system and healing that, you know, I've really come to understand the truth of the way that trauma manifests in, in us and animals and the way that when we've been put through an extremely fearful situation or when we have beliefs that lead us to be extremely fearful, often we'll cover that up, first of all, so we won't even admit that that's happened. We won't even admit that we've got that fear. And secondly, that fear will just bubble under the, in the subconscious and the unconscious just enough that when it gets triggered by something, we can lash out in anger to protect us from what we're frightened of. And that's what Ultimately, that cat was doing in an unconscious way. Something was triggering it, perhaps just the fact that I was stroking it, it was getting relaxed, it was starting to feel the real feelings underneath the surface, and then it would lash out. And I didn't understand that, so, you know, I got a bit frustrated with it. But as I've grown older, I realised, well, hang on a minute, I do that sometimes. We all do that sometimes. People that I've been close to who have been through trauma, I've been through a near-fatal car accident. You know, we all have this shared behaviour where where we can allow our fear to actually direct our action unconsciously in a way that's aggressive and angry i mean I, I, violence is thankfully not something that i've done or that i've been the victim of as a result of this but at least not as an, as an adult perhaps through random people who attacked me when i was a teenager um, but but definitely through speaking and having arguments these things are quite common i think and very important to understand that and to realize that often when you're arguing with someone you're not really arguing with someone who's thinking in a coherent fresh open clear way that's able to hear you you're actually arguing with a, a reflex that's being triggered from old experiences that's designed to protect that person that's being triggered in an inappropriate situation. And there's not much they can do about it because they don't understand it's happening. They're not conscious of it and they haven't healed that part of themselves. So the reason I'm explaining this in such detail is because uh, Daniel doesn't really explain this part of the situation. He may well understand it. He just doesn't explain it. So I think if you if you combine what he says in this talk with the kind of information I'm putting across, you've really got something exceptionally powerful and potent to create excellent progressive change in humanity and on this planet in a way that can benefit everyone. So yeah, absolutely. If you if you like this kind of talk that I'm that I'm putting across here, then do check out some of my videos on this, such as one of the recent ones I put out on emotional healing, and I'm gonna put some more out in the future too, as and when I get time. So I'm just going to skim through some other points here as well and uh, leave you to watch the rest. If I keep paying attention to hypernormal stimuli that are moving quickly, so I get the stimuli of lots of novelty, I'm going to be decreasing my attention. But if I want to have any kind of nuanced view, I have to be able to hold multiple partial views in working memory. It's not that some people have good memory or good attention and other people don't intrinsically, it, any more than some people are buff and some aren't intrinsically. It's developable, but it has to actually be developed. So, uh, so the impulse to say, hey, make it really simple so everybody can get it, and the impulse to say, help people actually make sense of the world well are, are different things. So just following on from what I was saying about emotional processing, memory is very, very tied in to emotions. and he is correct. You can develop and improve memory. Uh, it's important to understand that to do that, you must process your emotions. If you block out your emotions, you basically block out your memory. It's as simple as that. So 
it's not enough to just think better to have better memory and this idea of not dumbing things down is also essential it's so 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 common for people to try to conveniently remove details in order to simplify things and the result is that we actually don't understand what they're trying to describe and sometimes they'll even do that to try to make themselves appear more intelligent than they think they are <laughs> so or, or than someone else because they're com competitive so it's almost like well i can explain it using only 50 percent of the information that everyone else can but they don't actually explain it and you know that's also a technique that i see being used in schools certainly when i was at school and on the mainstream media sources that, and platforms that we're so familiar with. The narrative, narratives definitely there remove important information and leave just enough of the truth in that it sounds right, but conveniently they've left out things which, if you don't know them, lead you to believe certain things that aren't true, which serve them often. And a good example of that might be, for example, Buckminster Fuller or, or people of that nature who uh, invented amazing ideas and phenomena and realized realized amazing phenomena and invented machines or whatever it was use logic in in intelligent amazing ways and they're not taught in schools at all and that basically means that some of the smartest people on this planet are held away from the children of the future that the children don't get to learn from their wisdom and that's not by accident in my opinion and and you know some policies set in schools might that choose the books that children see might use the justification that the average IQ of children is a certain level and you know these books are too high an intelligence level for them but that's backwards you know that it's through exposure to high intelligence that you're able to receive and attune to that wisdom and start to learn it and integrate it yourself and the higher the intelligence of someone if they're balanced the more capable they are of explaining something to someone else as well so dumbing down society really doesn't help anyone and the people who are doing it deliberately at the top of these empires thinking that they're going to maintain their power position by you know retaining all of the best information for themselves they don't help themselves either because they end up having this world that they then hate with all these people they call idiots you know and, and perhaps that's part of why they do it they like they get a kick out of thinking that they're the genius a bit like jeffrey epstein we've we've been hearing about um you know reveled in basically saying that he owned this town was one of the quotes from one of the girls in court uh, you know, and at the same time, we've got certain scientists saying that actually he was a, an intellectual midget kind of thing. So you've got, a, it's about cultivating a false narrative and a false image among people who aren't the smartest among us, but do, who do have the ability to control information. And they can craft our perception of reality in such a way that they seem smarter than they are. And, you know, amass huge amounts of wealth around them. If you think, for example, that the that wars are the ultimate solution to our problems, then people who fight and start wars and sell weapons to you are like great people. So you should be very careful when you have those ideas in yourself and check where exactly you got that information from. Because as they say, the victors win the wars, basically write the books and write the history. We have a very whitewashed version of history that we're taught in schools. And you'll find that if you keep digging into real history everywhere without deliberately removing any source you'll find very 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 different versions of, of of what's gone on on this planet to what you're taught in schools so when we look at why does an individual distort information the the most fundamental way of thinking about it is there's this idea in terms of signaling like if i'm just in nature watching and i'm watching what is happening with rabbits and trees and birds. I'm getting information about them that they aren't even intending to, tr to transmit. And so the information is just reflective, right? Light's actually reflecting off of them of the nature of reality. As soon as there's an agent that can share information strategically for an intention, then I don't know if what they're sharing is reflective of reality or reflective of what they think will advance their intention. And that's kind of the key distinction, is that the moment we get abstract signaling, which language allows us and the ability to kind of forecast and our ability to model each other, and your well-being and the basis of your agency doesn't seem coupled with my well-being and the basis of my agency perfectly. In the case of the partner wanting to cheat and get away with it, right, there's a decoupling of well-being and agency. In the case of if I'm a marketer of a product and I want you to purchase it, 
um, whether my product is actually the best product or not, <laughs> whether a competitor's product is better, whether you need the product or not, I want you to think that you need it and to think that mine is the best, right? So there's a breakdown between what seems to be in my well-being and what seems to be in your well-being. So wherever there's a, a, any misalignment in agency and there's the ability to share signal for strategic purposes, then you have a basis to have signal that's being shared that isn't just truthful, right? So then we look at, well, where is that happening? And it's fucking everywhere, right? Boom. <laughs> so this is the essence of, of what I spend most of my time on the internet talking about, is basically highlighting the false information narratives being spread on so many different topics. And then I'll find, I mean, when I first started doing this, I would find 90% of people thought I was wrong, probably, depending on where I was speaking. Now it's probably more like 50% of people think I'm wrong because they're starting to see more and more and more how much they're being lied to. And, you know, my aim is that by the time I leave this realm, <laughs> maybe everybody understands this. Um, so this concept of everybody lying to some extent is a big part of what I want to change. And we don't need to be doing it. That's the frustrating part. We do it because we mistakenly believe we don't have enough power to achieve what we need to achieve without lying. Sometimes. Or, alternatively, we might be psychologically misaligned or emotionally misaligned so that we actually want to cause people harm for some reason. The key to solving all of this, which he doesn't touch on in this, is the heart. And heart healing is a big part of what I've been working through myself for a long time. Your heart, if you actually focus into your heart right now and and actually feel your heart don't just use your mind to analyze what the heart is actually feel be your heart be conscious in and of your heart you may find that you have this sense of feeling beyond just thinking in there but you also have thinking and if you the more you do that the more able you are to actually realign the way that you think so that you don't manipulate other people and you don't strategically deceive people and so on you just be yourself and you be open and honest and generally speaking, you'll feel a lot better as a result of that. Your memory will improve. You've got less lies. Well, you've got no lies to remember. So, you know, you've got more energy available to do whatever you want to do. You're not caught up in twists and turns and deception. That's how you optimally live as a human. And many people understand that in various different ways and to a certain degree, but not so many people deliberately consciously live that way moment to moment because they know it's how they need to be. Just like you breathe and you know that you need to breathe you also need to focus into your heart and live from the heart so that you act with integrity and balance and yet we typically have no clue about that most people the solutions to many of these problems that he's highlighting are known it's just that they require each of us individually to live them rather than just having one of us write them down and say there you go it's done and you know this takes me back to when i was a salesman actually when i was 16 no probably 18 years old selling electrical equipment and in a big superstore and I didn't perform as well as some of the salesmen I would usually come out I don't know maybe in the top 25 percent which wasn't bad but there were people ahead of me and I would look at them and think well they don't really seem to be well they're not more intelligent than me they don't you know they don't get as good grades as me that kind of thing um in terms of just raw IQ but they were selling better than me so you know, I wasn't in there really to compete, but at the same time, I was interested to know why they were doing that or what they were doing that was allowing them to succeed more. And I realised after not very long that basically they were just deceiving and lying to people is what it came down to. And the power of their lies was apparently more effective at causing people to buy things than my power of having integrity. So that was an issue in a way. And I didn't, you know, it's not like I reported them or anything, but it caused a challenge in me and at no point did I decide I should just lie as well because that's not who I am, that's not what I'm about. But there were certain people who came to me who thanked me deliberately and said to me, you know, you're the only salesperson I've ever met who says it how it is, who tells us the truth. Thanks for that. And, you know, that was great. It, I wanted my managers to see that and say, hey, this is how we should be running the shop. You know, people come back because they know that you, they can trust you. That's why I go to shops. If I can trust people, I'll go back. But they didn't really seem to see it like that. They were purely just, you know, primarily based on numbers and selling and short-term gains. 
everything's short term and that's what we see in politics as well we see you know presidents and prime ministers only needing to hold office for a certain number of years so they know that they can tell many many lies as long as it takes more than three or four years for them to be caught out then they're all right and that's basically how they operate and that's not optimal is it that's not how we create long-lasting sustainable solutions that's how we destroy the planet and that's why we're in such a mess basically it's a big part of it so we need a massive culture shift away from short-term lazy thinking posturing competition jump jumping to conclusions judgments as well as a big deal which he doesn't really talk about in this video basically judgments forming conclusions based on incorrect information and guessing just because you think you must have an answer and aren't okay with not having an answer these seemingly simple things when you combine them create this huge monstrous nightmare that causes untold suffering that we look at when we see the world with without rose tinted glasses on so yeah it's you know this is a journey of going through the shadow self ultimately as psychologists might call it and, and coming out the other side and healing those parts of ourselves so that we reclaim the parts of us that are living in delusion and actually bring us into our own true power and again that's uh, that's basically the focus of what i'm doing online and in general so you might see a lot of my posts are about conspiracy subjects crimes uh all kinds of problems in society but i'm not doing that just to gain attention based on the misfortune of other people or even to just to create fear or anything like that i'm doing it because i want to make people aware of the problems that they're hiding from so that we can then look at the solutions and i try to mix both together basically problems and solutions so yeah if this has excited you which i hope it has and if you've you know you're the kind of person that wants to solve the world's problems and become the best version of yourself definitely do check out the rest of this video from daniel and definitely do come and drop into eureka.org ureka.org say hello and check out the wealth absolute treasure trove really of information in there on these sorts of topics uh, you can also get paid through the scene blockchain for posting on there and at some point i'm looking to actually expand that network so that it becomes more of a kind of problem solving space where people can actually get paid for researching and solving problems. I mean, ultimately, you can do that now, uh, but we may seek to get some more funding for that so that people actually get really good payouts for coming and helping people and solving problems and, and actually doing research. So literally, come and get paid to learn, which is would be a first. I, I you know, other than government grants for your studying, which really is just there to keep you alive and almost don't really exist even in Britain now can't think of any examples really where people usually can just come freely without a contract without any expectation and get paid for learning and helping others pretty amazing and that's what i'm helping to build so if you want to help me out with that then do come and say hello in eureka or mail me or come and contact me on discord or however you can find me to contact me how you might want to help or just your ideas about the whole thing so yeah definitely let me know in the comments what you think about all this and definitely share this on with other people as well if you've liked it because uh, it's going to help a lot of people i'm pretty sure of that and it, <laughs> if nothing else it means that the trolls give me less hassle so you'll be helping me out and doing me a favor at least uh so do like subscribe share upvote reblog resteam whatever you can think of just to uh give this a bit of a support and a thumbs up and i appreciate that greatly so uh yeah until next time peace